Having looked at the duties of trustees, we're now going to take a step back and look at trustees in general. So how can you become a trustee? How can you get removed, replaced, etc. before we start looking at the powers that trustees actually have? So in this video, we're going to be looking at the appointment of trustees. Now, the first trustee will ordinarily be appointed by the settler or testator in the deed or will creating the trust. In the case of a trust created by a settler, the trustees will ordinarily be the parties to the deed and the trust is constituted upon the conveyance of the trust property to them. In a will, the same persons may be appointed executors and trustees. However, of greater concern is the appointment of new trustees. Okay. Now, with express trusts, the trustees will be appointed by the deed and may be parties to the deed. So it is possible for a settler to exclude the terms of the 1925 Trustee Act in whole or in part. Therefore, the settler uh, may choose to create a different mechanism by which trustees are to be appointed to the office of trustee. This might be done, for example, to facilitate tax planning by enabling trustees resident in jurisdictions outside the UK to be appointed to the office of trustee. We also have trust set up in a will. So in this sort of situation, a trustee will be expressly appointed. So trustees will be originally appointed in one of those two ways. We've got the express trust or trust set up in a will. Those are the way that we can set up a trust in its original format. So when we create a trust, we can create the trustees. We can establish who the trustees are. Now, any number of trustees can be appointed, but usually it's a maximum of four. Now, if there are any more than four trustees, it usually does get a little bit complicated. So there is no restriction upon the number of trustees, but it is inconvenient to have too many, and it's rare to have more than four, save in the case of charity and pension trustees who can act by majority. In trusts of land, under the Trustees Act 1925, Section 34, this restricts the number of trustees to four. So there are exceptions, and the most important of which is that of land vested in trustees for charitable, ecclesiastical, or public purposes. Okay, so although in the majority of situations where you have a trust of land, you will have to have only a maximum of four trustees. There are some situations where um, that isn't the case. Okay. The other thing that is necessary when appointing trustees is that they must have capacity and capacity comes in a number of ways. So you must be over the age of 18. That is a legal capacity and you must have the mental capacity so you can understand what your responsibilities are. In other words, you must be sui juris. And you also must accept. So you must be willing to do the job. You must accept the responsibility of being a trustee. Note, you may also accept your appointment through conduct. So if you act as a trustee without expressly accepting, your conduct can be taken to be an implicit acceptance of taking on the role of trustee. So in other words, a person may refuse to act as a trustee and is perfectly entitled to refuse the entire office from the outset. Okay, And we can see that from the case of Robinson and Pett from 1734. And acceptance will be provided, uh, will provide it clearly if the trustee either signs the trust instrument, so that's Jones and Higgins from 1866, or gives an explicit, explicit declaration of assent such as writing a letter to that effect. And we can see that from Vickers and Bell from 1864. Nevertheless, two complications do arise. So what if the trustee accepts the office of trustee initially and then seeks to refuse that office subsequently? If the trustee has accepted the office of trustee and then seeks to repudiate it later, the refusal of the office is ineffective. And we can see that from Wee Sharman's Wills Trust from 1942. Instead, the trustee, for which she will have become, would have to seek formally to disclaim the office. 
and that's what we're going to consider later too. The second problem in relation to refusing to act would arise if an individual had refused to act as trustee from the outset, but had nevertheless come inadvertently into possession of the property which he was supposed to hold on trust. So suppose, for example, that a settler thrust a valuable chattel into the hands of his intended trustee while on his deathbed and died before the intended trustee had a chance to request that the settler appoint someone new as trustee. In that situation, the trustee could not be bound by the office of trustee having repudiated the office, but nevertheless should be treated as being either a bare trustee of the property required to hold it until some other person can be found to act as trustee in her place or as a bailee of the property to the same extent. Okay. And finally, trustees hold as joint tenants subject to juice accrescendi, so as to trustees um, die, the property will automatically vest in the surviving trustees. So we want to make sure there's always someone there making sure the trust goes smoothly. Now, appointment can also be done by the courts, so equity will not allow a trust to fail for want of a trustee. If, um, if there are no trustees, the court may appoint them under the power conferred by Section 41 of the Trustee Act 1925. So if you're not appointed by a deed or a will, as we've looked at a second ago, the court can appoint a trustee. And equity will not allow a trust to fail simply because it doesn't have a trustee. Section 41 of the Trustee Act 1925 provides that the court may, whenever it is expedient to appoint a new trustee or new trustees, and it is found inexpedient, difficult or impractical to do so without the assistance of the court, make an order appointing new trustee, um, a new trustee or new trustees. Therefore, the court's own discretion does not require that it be necessary for the court act merely that it is considered to be expedient, that is convenient or advantageous, on the basis of the difficulty in relying on some other mechanism. So, for example, where one trustee obstructs the proper administration of a trust by refusing to consent to the actions by the other trustees, the court may deem it expedient to appoint a new trustee to enable the trust purposes to be performed. However, this power will only be exercised by the court where the normal mechanism for appointing a trustee has failed. So really this is a last resort, but they will do it if they need to do so. The power may be used to replace or appoint trustees either where there is no one capable of exercising the statutory power or where those who have the power are unable to agree. So an example of where there will be expediency is where one trustee is obstructing the proper administration of a trust by refusing to consent to the actions proposed by the other trustees. In such a situation, the court may deem it expedient to appoint a new trustee to enable the trust purposes to be performed. Okay. So there are some matters with which the court should take into account when replacing or appointing a trustee, and these are as follows. The first is the wishes of the settler, okay? So the question is, is it in the trust document? Does it talk about who they want to be the trustee, or had they expressed it in some way? So if the settler has sort of mentioned somewhere that they want a certain trustee, uh, and it is their wish to appoint a certain trustee, then this will be taken into consideration by the court. The second consideration would be trustees should not favour some of the beneficiaries over others. So when appointing trustees, they should remain neutral in their appointment and should not favour some beneficiaries over others. In other words, appointing a relative of one of the beneficiaries as a trustee is not really a desirable option. And finally, does it promote or impede the execution of the trust? The court wants to appoint someone that helps the, the trust to continue. Okay, They don't want to appoint a trustee that will prevent the trust from continuing smoothly. So 
put another way, the factors which a court will take into account when exercising its jurisdiction to appoint trustees were discussed by Turner in the case of Reed Tempest in 1966, and the court should always have regard to these three prime requirements. The wishes of the person by whom the trust was created, the interests which may be conflicting of all the beneficiaries, and the efficient administration of the trust. And we have a quote here from Temple in this Reed Tempest case that, that says that the mere fact that the existing trustees did not want a particular person should not be taken into account as that would give them a veto over the court's appointment. So even if the trustees don't want this other person to be appointed with them, the court will say that this will not prevent that person from being appointed. They look to whether the trust will function and therefore look for the most suitable person. So the court will disregard any protest from the trustees and beneficiaries for the most part. So Temple set out the matters which the court should take into account when appointing a trustee. Okay, So they should consider the wishes of the settler and that the trustees should not favour some of the beneficiaries over others. The court should consider whether the appointment would promote or impede the execution of the trust, but the mere fact that the existing trustees did not want a particular person should not be taken into account, as that would give them, as it says here, a veto over the court's appointment. Okay, and finally we have the public trustee, which is appointed by the Lord Chancellor. Now, the public trustee is a public office holder appointed by the Lord Chancellor under the Public Trustee Act of 1906. In theory, any person may be named the public trustee as a trustee of a trust under the Act. However, the public trustee is not obliged to accept any trust and will in practice only act as the trustee of trusts for the benefit of persons under a disability where there is significant dispute between existing trustees or as a last resort. So just like all of the um, just like all of us, the public trustees don't have to accept this position, but generally he will accept the position when dealing with trust for the benefit of a minor, a person with a disability, someone who needs some extra care, etc. Okay? But it is usually very much a last resort. Okay, that is the end of this video on the appointment of trustees. In the next video, we're going to continue talking about the sort of administrative factors of trustees and look at the replacement and removal of trustees. But if you have any questions about this particular video, then please leave a comment below and I'll get straight back to you. Thank you very much for watching.